Great to see you. Glad you could be here. We're just getting it. Choose the tech check. Can you hear us? Yes. PowerPoint. Yes. Cool. I, I saw oh, Della yeah. nodded. Great. You know Thank you, guys. So before we get uh, started, I'm from the emergency department. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've met before. Yeah. 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 No, 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 no. It's fine. Yeah. Otherwise, they won't hear me. So, uh, okay, let's get started. Uh, thank you guys for uh, joining the meeting. Uh, just a quick note to everyone, we will be recording the meeting for the documentation and later review. And uh, so this is our first uh, quarterly meeting uh, in 2019 for the Southwest Colorado Healthcare Sector Partners Alliance, AKA the SPA meeting. Uh, my name is Key and I apologize, the, the camera on my computer is kind of awkward, so you can see my up, the lower uh, <laughs> parts of my face. So uh, so uh, please make sure, um, so on the screen, please make sure, if you can, please turn on your camera. We're, um, we, we're happy to see you. And make sure you can hear me. If you can't, uh, try to speak, speak up and let us know. Uh, or chat, yes. and. So please di display your full name, first name, last name, if you can, if you are joining by computer. Uh, and make sure you're muted uh, if you're not talking. And then also please open the chat box. So uh, I'll do the same here so we can see if you have questions or comments during the meeting. So, uh, and before we get started, I want to first uh, kind of apologize for sending you guys several meeting invitations uh, in the past few days because I think we are having some trouble synchronizing uh, all the calendars from uh, old computers to new computers. So uh, sorry for the confusion. I think today uh, we don't have that many participants, I think. So let's just do uh, uh, a quick introduction. Um, yeah, we don't have to follow the slides right now. We just do a vocal introduction for everyone. I think I'll start and then uh, our uh, my colleagues here in AHAC at AHAC would, would follow and then we can just uh, whoever wants to speak up. Uh, so my name is Key. I am the former education liaison at, uh, at SWC AHAC. Um, yeah, uh, Mary. Oh, sure. I'll go ahead. next. I'm cool. Mary Dengler Fly, Regional Health Connector with Southwestern Colorado AHEC. And then Christina, why don't you come next? I'm Christina Crane, and I am the Community <laughs> Programs Manager. I have taken over Key's position, and I'm filling some big shoes. He, he will be greatly missed. But um, so moving forward, I will be um, your spa convener in the future. <laughs> I'm happy to be on board. Great. Dr. Dan Kaplan, I run Colorado Addiction Treatment Services in Durango. Um, been doing addiction medicine now for four years. Previously in the emergency department for 26 years. Mm -hmm. Welcome. And my name is Paul Gibson. I'm the uh, clinical director of the emergency department at Mercy Hospital. Um, I've been there about almost 35 years now. Wow. So, All right. Wow. Congrats. Been around the block. Yeah. <laughs> so were you at the, when it was like the oh, hospital yes. out here? Yes. I, moved, I moved here in 1985 to get a degree to get out of the medical field. Yeah. So I got my degree. How did that go? Here I still am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Welcome. Okay. Whoever wants to go next. Hi, I'm Della. Um, I'm an AmeriCorps member and I'm part of the Community Opioid Response Program and I'm based out of San Juan Basin Public Health. Welcome, Della. Thank you. And I'm Carol Ann Hendricks. I am with Ray Region 1 with Rocky Mountain Health Plans. Hi, Carol Ann. <laughs> Huh. My name is Heather Otter. I'm with Region 9 Economic Development as the project manager. And I normally would turn on my camera, but I'm taking this opportunity to eat a late lunch during our meeting. And so I didn't want to be doing that in front of everybody because I'm having soup. It's a little messy. No problem. No problem. <laughs> but, uh, I'm glad to be here. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Heather. <laughs> welcome. Yeah. Hi, I'm Karen Lamate. I'm the new CNO at Southwest Health Systems. And uh, so I'm glad to be joining to find out what this group is about. 
Great. Great. Well, welcome, Karen. Karen. Yeah, thank you. And Karen, what was your title? If you would mind, you know. Santa up here. You know. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> we've met. That's right. And Stephanie Clements uh, actually typed in, as instructed on the slide. <laughs> so she's the chief uh, nursing officer at Mercy. So welcome, class, Stephanie. Uh, who else? Is that all, everybody? I think so. All right, great. So before we uh, jump into our content today, I would like to introduce, uh, I think as you probably know, um, March 1st was, was actually my last day with, with AHEC, and then you have met Christina already, and Christina gonna be the new SPA convener. Uh, and she's also the new uh, community programs manager here at AHAC. We also have a new member. Uh, well, we, we also have a new ED, interim ED, Jody Powers. She's not here with us today, but uh, I'll, uh, I'm sure you will all meet her in the next meeting. And also we have a new uh, education liaison, Heather uh, Sorensen. So just want to uh, give you a quick uh, update about uh, uh, the personnel change here at the AHAC. So I think next one, yeah, I would just uh, um, hand it over to uh, Christina from now on and she's gonna uh, quickly review the agenda today. So Christina, <laughs> could you? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and like I said, it's I'm happy to be on board and um, you will be receiving um, meeting invites from me moving on in the future. So, uh, but yeah, I just wanted to welcome our guest speakers. We're actually, and um, I'm super excited to hear these three gentlemen speak about um, the opioid crisis and kind of what's going on in our state and kind of even what's happening locally as well. So um, I guess if we're good on time, which we are right on time, Mr. Paul Gibson. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Paul Gibson. He is with, he is the Director of Emergency Services at Mercy, and he will be talking about the Alto project program. So, Paul, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Um, had I known my boss was going to be on the line, I probably wouldn't oh. be, <laughs> be more nervous. So, hi, Stephanie. How are you doing? I'll, and, I'll do, a, do a crowd. So. <laughs> so, just a really brief little history. Back, back in 2015, in response to the uh, opioid crisis that was building annually, um, opioid deaths in um, the nation was the number one killer of um, American citizens under the age of 50. So that worked out to be about one person every 36 hours in Colorado. Wow. So the Colorado Hospital Association decided to take that on as a, as a real challenge and try and see if we could reduce the, um, the number of opioids that we are being prescribed, specifically through the emergency departments. <clears throat> so in 2016, they sent out a survey across Colorado um, asking for um, ideas and input on how we could best address the um, opioid crisis. And um, the results of the survey came back with four different areas that uh, could possibly be worked on. One was limiting the opioid use in the emergency department. Mm -hmm. Two was using alternatives to opioids, ALTO, which is what ALTO, alternatives to opioids, uh, for the treatment of pain, um, reduce the harm, um, in the emergency departments, and then the treatment of op opiate addiction after, which is what I believe Dr. Kaplan's going to be talking about here pretty quick. So the Colorado Hospital Association decided to focus on using alternatives to opioids uh, for the treatment of pain. So in 2016, they enlisted the, uh, the help of 10 hospitals in Colorado, small hospitals and large hospitals alike, to um, run a pilot program to offer, instead of offering um, well, let me back up just a minute. The number one reason that people uh, visit emergency departments is pain, for pain. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's always been, um, yeah. let's give them some pain medicine, let's take the pain away. Um, the Joint Commission, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The Joint Commission yeah. forced us to right. do that with the pain scores. Right. The Joint and, Commission uh, came down and said, you will reduce the pain, you will. They come in with a level of pain. Press um, um, So we were questions. forced forced to give opioids. Right. Patients had to leave the ER at zero. At the pain yeah. score had to be zero. Zero. Wow. Mm -hmm. that was like the fifth yeah. yeah, it was yeah. Right. Oh. Yeah. That was a combination of the American Pain Society yeah, and the exactly. AMA yeah. and the Joint Commission. Perfect trifecta. Right, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Right. Um, so in, in the study, in the 
the study with the 10 hospitals, they were looking at, in that first study, in the first round, they wanted to reduce the amount of um, pain medicines given to patients by 15%. After a year, they found that they were able to reduce the number of narcotics given in the emergency department by 36%. Mm -hmm. So it was a highly successful uh, trial, high, highly successful um, mm -hmm. um, survey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in 2018, so oh, that was between 2016 and 2017. Um, 2018, um, Centura Health throughout Colorado, all there's like 18 hospitals and several um, urgent care centers and urgency centers, decided that they were gonna adopt that as well and start a program, an Alto program. So last year, um, all facilities throughout Centura, um, which is going to be the largest hospital system to adopt mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. um, they called all their leaders in, all their educators in, they, they educated them <clears throat> into, the, um, into what, um, um, we need to do as far as reducing the amount of narcotic usage in the ER. So they brought in physicians, the nursing staff, the nursing leaders, um, all across the board, and then starting uh, late last year, implemented a program called Alto. So um, let me back up again. During that study, during the 10 um, hospital hospitals, there was over 130,600 ER visits. Um, there were 35,000 um, prescriptions for medications, narcotics, and they changed that by 36%. They decreased that, that overall by 36%. And the wow. use of alternative medications. The number of oh, prescriptions or the quantity of yeah. tablets yes. was decreased. Yes, which it says projected decrease in opioid doses. Doses. Okay. Right. Doses, which <laughs> is the, um, <laughs> oh, they have yeah. a morphine equil yeah, equivalent I mean, in units, yeah, yeah, yeah. is what they reduce. So, right. um, and then one big thing they were worried that these patients coming in that the uh, satisfaction scores were going to decrease mm. the, because of that. Mm -hmm. Turns right. out there was no decrease in the patient satisfaction scores. It was just neutral right across the board. Okay. Okay. So what do you mean satisfaction scores. Like what do you just... at the end of every visit, all of our patients get a survey. Oh. Okay. And they rate the care that they've gotten, not only in the ER but their hospital stays or whatever department they're using. Right. Those come back. They either come back good or bad. Mm -hmm. um, depending on what care they're being given. I'm happy to say that our ER has got some of the highest uh, staff satisfaction or patient satisfaction scores. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. they have taken out that question about pain, though, as well. Mm -hmm. So that's been a really wow. kind of a really Was your pain adequately addressed? That um, question? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, so yeah, we've adopted that now. And um, all, it's a slow process. We're trying to change a behavior that physicians and hospitals have had for years and years and years and years. And what they're finding out is, you know, they would treat for pain, they would mask the pain. Now there's no pain medicine in the world that takes away pain. It makes you feel less, yeah, it makes right. you care less about that's it. That's really well put. Yeah, <laughs> so, so what do you wanna do if someone comes in in pain because pain. they have an inflammatory process, you wanna address the inflammatory process, not necessarily the pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So by giving alternatives, and you address that inflammatory process and the pain level will come down. And the goal, of course, is to reduce the amount of narcotics and reduce the, uh, or help uh, fix the narcotic uh, usage throughout the state. So mm -hmm. in a nutshell, that's what we're trying to accomplish at Mercy. Um, people come in, they want pain medicine. Mm -hmm. So we have to script our, uh, how we talk to the patients. We have to talk with the doctors about, you know, what we're gonna do instead, we're gonna try this. Uh, it's not to say we're going to withhold pain medicine across the board. I mean, there are obviously things that show up in the emergency department that you have to give yeah. pain medicine for. Right. Once you get the initial pain under control, then you start treating the cause of the pain and um, reduce the amount of narcotics throughout the hospital stay. Mm -hmm. So basically, am I on, on track with that? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> many, many years of uh, working in the emergency department, um, not mm -hmm. with Paul, but uh, other emergency departments. Mm -hmm. uh, I have experienced exactly what he's been saying. Um, the tough thing is that pain is subjective. You can't measure it. You mm -hmm. can't test for it. If, That's right. Uh, unless they have an obvious deform you know, fracture or something, it's not obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes a lot of judgment. It's not black and white, it's a lot of gray. Mm -hmm. uh, um, a children, child with a headache, the 
does it need hajikodo? Mm -hmm. You know, so the, there are certain things that uh, are, are, are the person with the femur fracture does deserve opioids. So right. uh, the, the, <clears throat> that's black and white, but the, um, there's other things, that, you know, the belly pains or this and that mm -hmm. and, uh, and such. But I think it's, it's, it, it's a move that is long overdue. The pendulum swung way far, too far to the other side about the zero pain on discharge. Mm -hmm. And this is really a, a, a cognitive, well thought out, I think, uh, mm -hmm. process that just needs to continue. Mm -hmm. And it's just about, how, like Paul said, how you speak to your patients, what their expectations are, and redirecting those expectations right. mm -hmm. that they're not going to be numb anymore. That, that you know, right, right, you're changing the culture. Yeah. Right. The, yeah. Exactly. It takes time and a lot of work and a lot of effort and some okay. angry people, mm -hmm. patients, uh, mm -hmm. but, but it's just what had to happen. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And, yeah, one of our biggest issues is uh, people come in with back pain and headaches. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. Of course. The back nemesis. Pain, yeah. 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 <laughs> so back, back pain is caused a lot by um, injuries that are chronic injuries. I, I myself had a herniated disc for six months, mm -hmm. and I, didn't use, I chose not to use any um, narcotics. But yeah. I, can, yeah. I saw during that six-month period of time why someone would want to go in again. Mm -hmm. right. So you change that behavior, you find what what works best for the, the pain medicine. For me, narcotics just maybe hallucinate. Yeah, so yeah. I, I stopped using narcotics and <clears throat> use simple things like ibuprofen and, and the ANSIT type stuff. So, mm -hmm. so stretching. Yeah, stretching. Yeah. And yeah. Fixed, fixed, yeah, the surgical, uh, training. surgical yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. So we're right now in phase one of this process, which is directed specifically for the emergency departments. Going forward, we'll be moving it out of the emergency department into other units on the floor. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and that's, that's Alto in a, in a nutshell. Like you said. It's, I'm really, really happy and really feel lucky that, that Centura is taking on such a huge role mm -hmm. on this whole thing. And, and I said, across the board throughout the state and Kansas, um, we've adopted the Alto and it's, it seems, appears to be going very well. That's great. So, and yeah. more on the journals I've read, it, it, it uh, um, there's mm -hmm. certain ERs that are uh, completely opioid free, which I don't necessarily agree with. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really good program that uh, mm -hmm. I've been following. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Um, does anyone have any questions that are on the call for Paul? I have one, like yeah. the Centura is doing this, sure. uh, the system is doing mm -hmm. this across uh, Colorado. Mm -hmm. So like here, but Mercy is doing this program here in our region. So what, right. is, what do you see that is the biggest, like the barriers or like the very unique uh, challenges like we have here in terms of implementing all um, of them? You know, rural, rural areas, areas tend to have a lot of concentrated narcotic use. Mm -hmm. yeah. If they can't get the narcotics, what they go to is the heroin, the street drugs, mm -hmm. to try and, but it's generally after they become addicted to those narcotics, they can no longer get those narcotics. Yeah. So in conjunction with that, there has to be an effort to help reduce the, um, the heroin and the, uh, the illegal drugs that you can buy out on the street. Okay. So that's a big challenge, especially in rural areas. In the city, there's so many options for people in the city, so many different treatment plans, so many different um, options that they can get into and they can be directed to. Mm -hmm. It's a little easier to get in there. That's not to say they don't have their challenges. I mean, they have more treatment areas, but they also have more places they can go with the drugs. Mm -hmm. So um, we get the drug shoppers a lot. They you know, they'll go from um, facility to facility to facility. Luckily, there's a, a website that our docs can go to and see yeah. just how many times they filled prescriptions for right. and stuff. That's that. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and that helps. So, okay. Um, I think more and yeah. more physicians are getting on board to use that exactly. across the area, which is really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, you can it's have like, delegate. It's such a litigious society now. I, I heard this morning that there is a concerted effort to go after the drug companies because they're making their narcotics so strong, so they're blaming the drug companies. And that's only a matter of time before it gets down to the hospitals and the physicians and the people who actually deliver the medication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So rather than just put up with that type of thing, you want to work to get people off of that. Right, mm -hmm. right, so right, right. It's a, it's a big problem. And ERs are the front line of that. It's, so people think they can come and just 
walk in and get what they want. Yeah, yeah. let me ask right. you a quick question. Yeah. Um, what, in the ER specifically, because um, you know, I know we talk to providers, you mm -hmm. know, part of their role is in education, right. you know, raising awareness around what the drug does, safe storage, safe disposal, all of that. Do you, um, does that happen in the ER as we, well? Like, absolutely, we do a lot of education. Component. And actually in Mercy's ER, we several years ago adopted a, um, a no narcotic type policy. So if people come in for narcotic refills, we don't refill those. Right. We put a notice in every one of our rooms that says, although well, we're gonna treat you, we're gonna treat your pain, but don't expect us to just write a blank check for mm -hmm. narcotics. We've been doing that for years. Right. right. Um, so we, well, we, you know, we like to think at Mercy we're ahead of the game in a lot of stuff. And in that right. particular area, we really are, but this is really to come up. Right, and those uh, legacy patients are probably treated a little bit differently yeah, exactly. than the opioid naive patients, yeah, for exactly. instance. Um, and Mercy, did, did they have a prescription drug drop box? So if somebody, you know, they get drugs, can they, do, they, do you know no, where to send we, them to? We do them? not. Um, in fact, there are some regulations stating that you cannot bring, um, our pharmacy cannot accept those kind of um, oh, really? medications and stuff. So Oh, I thought was, there was, they were working to change that. I don't mean to put yeah. you on the spot at all, but I know CDPH has been working to get drop boxes yeah. within pharmacies. And well, so and that, I wonder if that's changing. And that could be the case in our pharmacy, but I, I don't know. Because yeah, I think you have to have a farm license in order to host a drop box. <clears throat> and that's mm -hmm. been like the roadblock to getting drop sure. boxes in some rural counties like we mm -hmm. have, you know. The and police the, department does, though. Um, oh, the really? sheriff's department sure. does in Bayfield, yes. too. Yes. The police oh. department does downtown. But I think there's only those two Walgreens. in all of. Uh, I don't think they do. I called them to find out. Oh, they recently. did. They used to. The one up here? Not I'll check on that. Because I called them and they said they, they don't. But oh, okay. um, I was trying to get a list of who does and who doesn't. And um, I was surprised to find how few there were, mm -hmm. but I was never sure whether Mercy yeah, did or I, not. So. You know, and that's a good question. I could check with our pharmacist when I get back. And, uh, oh, thanks. If you um, wouldn't mind letting me know, because yeah. um, we're, we're sure. planning a few events sure, in okay. April and it'd be good information to be able well, to Well, and if, Stephanie, if you're on the line, you can make it. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Maybe she heard me. Stephanie's on the spot now, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there any more questions for Paul? Oh, looks like we have one. Caroline, what alternative treatments other than oncology? Has been, okay, so what alternative treatments other than pharm pharmacology has been, have you been using, you been using and what areas? be working the best okay. and what has been um, surprising actually, and that's a great question uh, we have a unique program at mercy called tlc touch love and compassion where we have rns that go around to rooms of people who are in pain and they offer thighs they offer uh, eye pillows and um oh. want to check yourself yeah out. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very unique program um uh, i think we had about four nurses work between part-time and full-time and they just make rounds every day. If we need them in the ER, if we can't control the pain, we'll call them down to the ER and they'll, they'll do things like massages right. and nice. reduce lights, turn on. Huh. So it's a very, very unique program. We're actually very proud of that. It's, That's awesome. It really helps quite a bit. I bet patients love it. Oh, I've <clears> been there <throat> a patient a couple times and they come by every time. <laughs> I love it. Um, great question, Carol, thank you. And just another reminder to everyone, if you can just mute yourself. Um, we just hear some background noise yeah. from some some people. Okay, Any other questions for Paul? Oh. Great job, Paul. I'm yeah. having trouble with my sound. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. That was from Stephanie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was from your boss. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, all right then. Well, thank you so much. That was. That was very informative. Yes. <laughs> Took a lot of work. I know. Mm. And buy-in. Well, and that's the, the buy-in from the buy -in, staff yeah. and the doctors. And changing that culture. Changing yeah. Yeah. That that, so. It took a lot but of work. It's, it's going. Yeah. Do you by chance have material like that? You that, know, I like can extra? read this for you. This was um, Colorado Opioid Safety Collaborative, and it talks about the it talks about the sure. um, the pilot program and all the statistics. And okay. I've got another one of these that I can get, so I can leave this with That'd you. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah. Also have okay. a list of um, <clears throat> uh, narcotics. On one side is the opiate. The other side are the alternatives to the opiates. Oh, that's nice. So that's what, kind of what we're hoping is to go to the alternatives. Oh, one so this thing is I, what doctors are yeah. doing instead. Yeah, okay. The other thing I might mention, what this does is also empowers the nursing staff. 
Yes. If the doctor says, well, give him some morphine, the nursing staff is empowered to go back to that position and say, hey, do, can we try something else first? So oh, it's great. a really team-oriented uh -huh. kind of a thing. So great. yeah, you can have great. that information. Yeah, yeah. he's gabapentin for low back pain with ridiculous symptoms. Um, you know, that's what I used a lot was the gabapentin. Yeah, I, that's, what that's, what I yeah. that's what I used. So I didn't use any opioids. Right. Gabapentin yeah. helped me. Yeah, between the gabapentin and the... Uh, yeah, and the, yeah, it was great. I'm not sure, yeah. So, so, yeah, there you go. Does the Alter right. program have a website, like embedded oh, somewhere? Yeah, oh, yeah, so the Thank Centura you. The yeah. site, I think. Okay, okay. It's, well, while you guys are talking, or Dan's talking, I'll kind of look and see if I okay. can the website. Cool. So. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you again, Paul. We appreciate sure. that. And, um, now we are on to our next speaker. Oh, he's sitting right next yeah. to me. <laughs> this, I, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Dan Kaplan. Yes. Correct. Um, and you run the Colorado Addiction Treatment Services. Yes. Great. All right. Well. So, um, <laughs> thank you. I uh, finished medical school in 1990, and um, I did uh, my emergency medicine residency in the New York area. Uh, and I saw, even back then, quite a bit of opioid addiction. And it was my first exposure uh, uh, to substance use treatment and methadone clinics. I worked in a lot of the inner city hospitals, including uh, Lincoln, Coney Island, uh, Bellevue, um, Brookdale, which are all some of the worst of the worst uh, um, uh, facilities you can ever imagine. Um, in in uh, the South Bronx, we were averaging 12 gunshot victims a day, all wow. substance abuse yeah yeah we're wow. averaging two open thoracotomies a day in that er we, it was the middle of the crack cocaine wars we we're getting drive-by shootings um uh down to 12 and 13 year olds on mopeds uh, wow. so it was a pretty bad uh bad um uh scene which we're repeating right now cocaine's coming back methamphetamines mm -hmm. uh running <laughs> rampant it's the biggest increase in substance use and the in increase in uh overdose deaths um believe it or not heroin's leveling off and it's uh now fentanyl uh, and the uh, uh methamphetamine are the, uh, are the two big ones um most people don't know that methamphetamine can be in liquid form it's brought across in tankers uh, smuggled in trucks mostly through the legal um, ports of entry mm -hmm. they just had a uh, um, there have been some massive arrests uh, the I one in New that. Jersey I, saw, I heard and, about that, yeah. um, and that came in a shipping container so mm -hmm. they use submarines aircraft it's not going away um, addiction rotates substance to substance it used to be every 10-year cycles ex cycles accelerating right now mm -hmm. Uh, just in the last 10 years, we went from heroin to fentanyl to um, all sorts of different fentanyl analogs. It's, uh, about 100, they say right now, different <coughs> analogs. So you hear fentanyl, it's not necessarily fentanyl. It's, it's okay, all the different um, uh, formulations of it. Uh, recently in Connecticut, there were, I think, 77 overdoses in a park from fentanyl-laced spice. Um, nice. Did you wow. remember? Did you see about that? In Hartford, that it was yeah. in Hartford, Connecticut. Yeah, oh, within yeah. an hour, uh, they had 77 overdoses in oh. one park. Oh my gosh! Oh, they're, oh, they're all oh, using oh, the yeah, same pepper. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was okay. a disaster. Yeah. The all hospital system, the EMS right. system, was overwhelmed. Oh my yeah, gosh! Yeah, one park. Yeah. Wow. There is a uh, associated with this uh, um, uh, epidemic that we're just in the midst of right now. It's poly substance. It's not an opioid. It's not. Uh, it's very rarely one substance that are being used because uh, folks using opioids and heroin or are mixing it with uh, the methamphetamine so they don't get drowsy and it's not, not off. Um, we have to attack this problem from all different angles. Mm -hmm. It's just not, it's not an addiction <clears throat> problem. It's 80% of patients across the board have a co coexisting Mm -hmm. mental health issue yes. largely it's a chicken and the egg was it the mental health issue that, that mm -hmm. they started using the substance for to help medicate or in certain cases is it the substance that causes the condition which we don't know is you know people become psychotic the schizophrenics and marijuana association 
Um, now, were they going to develop schizophrenia anyway, and they used marijuana, or did the marijuana have something to do with the induction or the, or the expression of the disease? Again, unlikely we're going to be able to figure, figure that out in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the infectious disease component that goes along with it, uh, because uh, uh, largely the, uh, folks, uh, when they can't get their uh, pills of oxy or whatever they, the drug of choice is, they will go to uh, uh, heroin, which is not usually heroin, strictly just heroin anymore. And um, as their tolerance goes up and up, they might start sm snorting it or smoking it, foiling it. Mm -hmm. um, but it almost inevitably will lead to IV use. Mm -hmm. And um, people who say they would never share a needle will wind up sharing a needle if that's the only needle around. Mm -hmm. That's the spread of hepatitis C, HIV, all the hepatitis. Uh, the typical person with hepatitis C uh, um, uh, spreads it to four other people. Uh, HIV is HIV. I was ground zero in New York with that in the, in, uh, in, you know, in the 80s and 90s. Um, that's decreased, but in certain areas, recently in Ohio uh, last year, there was 167 cases in one small town, all over her from uh, her. Mm -hmm. um, there's needle exchange programs. There's talk about uh, safe injection sites. That's uh, uh, polarizing. Um, Colorado is. Uh, uh, in the midst of a methamphetamine, um, uh, I don't know if you've seen that. Um, it's the uh, uh, fourth most common cause of uh, overdose death in currently our, in, our state. in the state. Um, cocaine, believe it or not. So, and these are typically mixed overdoses. There is a huge problem with the dark web. And the, these uh, very in, uh, intelligent young kids are on there uh, obtaining all sorts of stuff on the internet. Um, there are numerous um, uh, there are illicit benzodiazepines. Tazolam is one of them that's very popular here that does not test positive for benzos on the typical urine drug screens. Hmm. Um, Which kids one does that come in? I'm sorry. I'm just curious, what form does that come in? The tablets, typically. Uh, there are uh, Xanax bars that, um, they're not Xanax, they're anything but Xanax. We had one kid taking them, he's a patient of mine, and his only drug screen came back positive for meperidine. Now, when was the last time you used Demerol in your yeah. ER? Yeah. Meperidine is Demerol. Mm -hmm. oh, I've Demerol. not used Demerol in right. 10 years, but that's what's being pressed into these Xanax bars, or it's fentanyl, or it's something else. Mm -hmm. um, this last That's week, exactly. there was a huge arrest in Arizona. If you, I can't, I don't, the quantity, I'm not sure, but there were <laughs> Oxycontin blue tablets. It said Oxycontin mm -hmm. on them, and they were fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And the, rain, the amount of fentanyl in the tablets varied from almost nothing to a lethal dose in the same batch mm -hmm. of tablets. <sighs> Where's it coming from? Mexico. That, yeah. that was uh, came through. Uh, through uh, they just made the arrest, and, and they were spreading it to the uh, uh, surrounding four states: Colorado, New Mexico, uh, Nevada, and uh, it was a big drug ring they busted. So, so as we've cut back on the pills and prescribing, and we all had to do that, the cartels and the greed has have taken over and have um, and. Uh, have created this uh, just huge industry. Mm -hmm. Cocaine, believe it or not, is coming back because the Colombian government largely has stopped enforcing um, uh, the shutting down of the coca plantations and the processing of cocaine. Um, this last big, um, what do you want to call it, shipment that they, mm -hmm. they got, which uh, had fentanyl in it as well. Um, then I, 7% of the cocaine uh, uh, um, supplies in this country now are contaminated with fentanyl and 30% are contaminated with levimosol, which is an in, which is a chemotherapy anti-helmet agent that causes a plastic uh, crisis and, and uh, bone marrow suppression. And I did have a patient with that in Albuquerque when I was working. Wow. Yeah. So... <clears throat> 
we got it. We can't. We just got to keep doing this. We it's uh, it's prevention. It's treatment. It's you know, it's um, education. Oh, a lot of education on, yeah. on the provider end and patient you and you and uh, um, user end um, Narcan training, Narcan distribution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it, it's largely again, we have to work. On my feeling, we have to get to the younger kids. Um, in middle school age, by the time you're in high school, it's almost too late. That's right. Um, majority of the patients are starting in their in their mid teens um, and experimenting. And those are the ones that end up with the psychological problems later because their yeah. brains haven't fully developed. That's and right. They're altering their brains all the time with that drug. So by the time they're in their late teens and early twenties, they become the, the psychiatric patients that we deal with. So largely, when folks start using their substance, they arrest their emotional development. So if they're starting to use substances at age 15 and they're 30, you're dealing with a 15-year-old emotionally. Mm -hmm. So once you get them off their substance, then they start having to uh, uh, grow emotionally. And it's hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you expect them to be a little further along. But yeah. 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 Yeah, which gets to the stigma, like we were talking about the other day. I There's mean, I think that really dovetails with the educational component, you know, like how do we reduce stigma? You know, and continue to just like get it out there, get it out there, get it out there. We've got a couple of events coming up, one at Fort Lewis, another one at the library, where we're doing, um, Jessica from the consortium is doing an naloxone training for community members okay. for free. Yeah. Um, she's not giving it out there, but she's giving out, you know, the education about how to use it, yes. and then we'll have educational materials like where you can go get it what it costs what insurances mm -hmm. they take and so forth but you know like that's what we're trying to do as much of as we can but um you know we just continue to have these conversations and get the word out and try to reduce stigma as much as we can so yeah i i entered the field of addiction medicine from emergency medicine um largely out of frustration um from my inability to actually help people that came to the emergency department. People come to the emergency department lying to us uh, to get opioids, the, the, the so-called, what we used to call drug seekers. They don't, they don't want to be there. That's the last place they want to be. It's because they can't go anywhere else and they're mm -hmm. desperate. Mm -hmm. And what do we do? We send them to detox or we send them away and, and uh, you know, I was complicit in that for decades, and that's what I was trained to do. And it's the biggest failure in medicine. We don't do that to diabetics or people having heart attacks or chest pain. We don't send them out to a social sleep right. on the floor and good luck here. Maybe we'll feed you. Right. We send people social detox. We miss um, intervening in their uh, treating any diseases or infections their underlying mental illnesses, their case management, their homelessness, their mm -hmm. all the other things. Mm -hmm. um, and for many, many years, that's just how we looked at addiction as a failure of morals. Now we know it's a, it's an actual medical disease. And that's why the medical community shunned uh, behavioral health and addiction. And that's why the 12 steps came about from 1935, because they had no medical treatment doctors didn't want to have any part of addiction. There was people who were failures. There's no, they're unsalvageable. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that's not true now. And, and uh, you know. Um, uh, that, that's one thing that the, that the Alto project hits on in the training is that it is a disease. It's not just a, mm. a social um, issue anymore, that it is a disease yeah. and you have to treat the disease. Exactly. Right, to, right. Yeah. Which is and, great for yeah. community members to know, but also for providers to exactly. know, too. I mean, everyone needs exactly. To know. And I, yeah. I look at it more like cancer. We can get this into remission, but mm -hmm. you mess around, it, it will come back with a vengeance, and mm -hmm. it will kill you. Mm -hmm. right. um, so part of this, and, and what I've learned working with people with substance use issues for 30 years now, is, is that there's no one-size-fits-all treatment for these folks. and. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you hear a hub and spoke for different treatment models. Well, I look at the patient as the hub and all the different modalities that are the spoke. And whether it's uh, yoga or physical therapy or acupuncture or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's so many different modalities mm -hmm. other than opioids. You know, um, there, a lot of this, a lot of addiction is uh, associated with mental health. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
issues, serious mental health issues. Almost 100% of my female patients have been sexually abused, raped, molested. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. 80 to 90% of my male patients have had significant emotional and physical trauma. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think on that, like before we're moving to the next speaker, can you give us a quick, like, like locally, like right here at, at CATS, like what's your, like how many patients do you deal with like weekly? I don't, just, just a quick, like. Sure. Um, so initially I just started, uh, my, my idea was to do uh, opioid free, uh, open up opioid free uh, clinic because I do back adjustments, I do trigger points. I'm an osteopath by training. I'm MD board certified in both emergency medicine and addiction medicine. Okay. So I was going to do, uh, open up a, a pain, uh, opioid free pain mm -hmm. clinic okay. and also do the data waiver suboxone um train because uh, i got my training in uh five years ago in that and then um i decided uh to open my horizons at the time i was pretty also came from the failure training failure moral training from the 80s and 90s to having opened my eyes and, and learn that this was a disease mm -hmm. Uh, and such. So uh, we decided to add methadone, which is a big ordeal. Uh, methadone uh, is a synthetic opioid invented around 1939 in Germany um, by Bayer. Um, mm. uh, it's been around for a long, long time. It started being used in New York City in addiction treatment by Dr. Dole in 1969. So methadone clinics have been around for 50 years. It's a so a very long, uh, safe medication. It's a pain medication. It was invented during, uh, in the 30s because uh, they had a shortage of morphine during World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, dolophine. It was the uh, uh, original name. Uh, it has a long half-life. It works good for addiction. It works. It's a great pain medicine, but only works for about, it has to be dosed about every eight hours for pain. It's a 24-hour, uh, once a day medication for addiction. Buprenorphine was invented in 69, 1969, and it was started being used for injectable pain medication in Europe in 1975. It wasn't start, uh, began being used for addiction treatment in 2000 under the data waiver 2000, which means um, you are waived from all the requirements of an OTP with the methadone uh, the requirements of a methadone clinic are extreme. The data waiver, 2000, in the year 2000, they waived those requirements. So mm -hmm. more people could prescribe buprenorphine. Right. Uh, the other services we do, um, then, so methadone is a pure agonist. Uh, buprenorphine, which under the general um, uh, name brand of Suboxone, um, is a partial agonist and has a sealing effect. Um, uh, the best way to explain that is if someone has a very severe heroin addict using really more than half a gram a day, suboxone is not going to work. If they're using less than half a gram a day, it should work. Um, um, if you think of opioid addiction as a 100-story building, methadone can go to the 100th floor, buprenorphine stops at the 50th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's just so we have different tools. Uh, you know, now, Trexone, which comes as a pill, it's been around for a long, long time. Uh, we don't know the mechanism of action for, but it works for uh, alcohol, methamphetamine, cocaine, other addictions. It does block to the mu opioid receptor, but does not um, uh, activate it. It's a pure blocker. Mm -hmm. And that comes under the brand name injectable shot of Vivitrol. Um, so are are you the type of clinic like are, so when you say a free clinic, are you still open like that as a free clinic or no? When we're not we have we get no public support no okay. grant money zero hmm. uh, almost 90 percent of our folks are on medicaid okay oh so we have a handful of folks on a special grant hmm. that just pays for their services okay so we can get people into service uh treatment for free most of our patients pay nothing okay and so mm -hmm. um the unfortunate ones that actually have jobs that are doing well have to pay a lot and okay. each, right. Insurance companies don't. Okay, let me ask you a quick question. What more could primary care providers do to um, identify addiction in their patients? Do you think they're doing a, generally a good enough job in our area? What else could they do and um, how could they get a hold of you? Like how should they? 
<laughs> so uh, primary care doctors, are, it, it's, a, it's a treadmill. They have to see so many patients. And these are really hard questions to they ask. They don't have a lot of time. They don't have the time. Mm -hmm. There's certain screening, a cage, uh, it's things like that, mm -hmm. the tools. Um, I mean, nursing, nursing staff or ancillary staff could probably initiate those. Uh, you know, we, we take walk-ins. Mm -hmm. okay. We take, you know. Okay. Uh, and, well, just yeah, uh, and I, we're we're open six days a week. I'm okay. there four to five days a week, uh, seeing patients. So, okay. um, if, yeah, if we don't turn people away. That's right. That's great. That's great. And uh, are you kind of the only one there? It's just it, it's just me right now. Yes, but yeah. just here in in Durango, you're kind of like the main. There are a few other people few doing others? it uh, here and there. Okay. Um, the, you know, the big push used to be to get it into pr the primary care offices. And originally, I thought that was a great idea, but these patients are, can be difficult, especially in the uh, beginning parts of treatment, and you have to have very firm boundaries with them. Um, and it's hard to, you know, to mix these folks with the diabetics and hypertension right. and the, the grandmas and the stroke yeah. follow-ups. <laughs> um, it's 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 uh, a little bit of a challenge yeah um so the really around services are crucial <laughs> to the success of the patient yeah so that's why I, I started expanding now we're doing fully integrated care for our folks we're doing the primary care because they don't want to go explain their uh use history to a, um, someone who's going to judge them mm -hmm. there's so much stigma in the, in the mm -hmm. primary care <laughs> providers and, and, and subspecialists in this right. town or in this area of the country mm -hmm. um, that their that patients don't like to open up. I, we at our clinic mm -hmm. we know judge. We don't use the stick method unless mm -hmm. we absolutely have to because these folks will beat themselves up every day. Mm -hmm. If by the time they've come to see me, they've tried to quit a hundred times mm -hmm. and right. they keep relapsing. So right. um, we we, um, we accept them. We understand, and that's how we come at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like we could be on. A call with you for like <laughs> several <laughs> hours. No, this so is, much, you're, it's so informative because it's just yeah, such a small, we so tap into on. just such a little bit of it, and we could go on. And I want I want to talk to you more, but but no, I, I I don't think we have any time for questions from any. Do we or can we uh, take a couple if anyone has any or let's let's wait. Let's finish okay. the okay. Uh, sure. and then we we'll come back um, to Dr. Yeah, thank Kaplan. you again. Seriously, oh, yeah. that, that was very informative. So, um, but yeah, stick around. We need to talk more. Um, so I apologize. Uh, we're, you know, let's, it, there's so much information to speak about, but the next uh, guest speaker that we have, I'm very sorry, Dr. Valak, uh, that we were running um, on our time here, but are you there? Can you hear us? I see that you're muted. Okay, I'll mute him. Me? Maybe. See, I'll mute. Oh. Hi, are you there? Okay. Hi. Hi, doctor. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, we can. So I'd like to introduce you. Um, so Dr. Valak is, am I saying that right, Dr. Valak? Yes, it is. That's okay, right. perfect. Well, welcome. This is Christina. Um, and Dr. Valak is with the Colorado Consortium. Wow. That's a tongue twister <laughs> for prescription drug abuse prevention. So you are um, hopefully braving the storm up there in um, in Denver, and you are safe. So um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Valak, who is also a professor at the Skag School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. So welcome. Can you hear us? Thanks. Thanks oh. very much, everybody. Re really appreciate the. Uh, the chance to to talk with you for a few minutes this afternoon about kind of what we're doing uh, on you know from the, the state perspective and the organization that I have the the privilege of coordinating uh, and just you know give you the super high level overview uh, kind of of what we're doing uh, the organization that as as you heard that I that I coordinate is called the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention. We actually started in 1986 was when I started with the organization. Um, was the Colorado Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force when we kind of saw that we had an opioid problem in 1985, 84, 85, that we were seeing stuff happening. 
and you know and we we got kind of quizzical looks from people that you don't know what you're talking about and it's not a big deal and we were in, in the in the big ramp up phase the early phase of of you know basically growing into the size of the problem that we're in now but we we saw a lot of the same stuff that um, i appreciate um i got to hear dr kaplan's uh remarks which i appreciated I, and i think he's right on the mark with everything he said couldn't agree more we're kind of seeing the same things that he described at the state level i also like that he's an osteopath my dad was an osteopath so go osteopathy <laughs> a comment. i'm a huge huge fan obviously of the do as my dad went to kirksville and the whole thing so uh, uh <laughs> yeah so I, I have seen that and 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 he was a pain doc and an anesthesiologist and all of that so got to see all this you know kind of growing up is what this looked like and and those things that are described but um, and have been doing this kind of work with the task force for a long time. And we focus on small scale things at first, like provider education and doing health fairs and whatnot in pretty small scale until this got big enough and enough people were dying, unfortunately, to get attention to it. And uh, in, in basically in, in 2012, 2011, 2012, when the National Survey on Drug Use and Health came out and showed us right up near the top, number two, and self-reported non-medical use of opioids, that number got the attention of the governor. And he said, well, we need to do some strategic planning. We need to address this better. Um, and we did, you know, I participated among about 100 people that participated in some statewide, you know, convenings and strategic planning to come up with a statewide strategy to try to address the opioid problem. Uh, and that led to, in 2013, six years ago, almost to the day now, um, the creation of a statewide strategic plan and the creation of our organization that, we're, that we call the consortium to try to address it. Um, and there was a discussion as to whether we would try to have a, one of the state agencies take this under their uh, umbrella because it's certainly a public health problem. Uh, no arguing with that. It's certainly a behavioral health problem and SAMHSA and you know behavioral health and substance use uh, and disorders of that kind that SAMHSA and OB, the Office of Behavioral Health, certainly, it's a behavioral health issue, of course. It's a regulatory issue to some extent, you know, with uh, prescribing and regulating doctors and pharmacies and, and all of that. So there's, a, there's an angle there. I wouldn't say it's purely a regulatory issue, but certainly all the state agencies have something to do with it. Um, so the discussion went that we would give this to a, a separate group, the consortium, and so that everybody would own it, but nobody would own it. And we would try to move forward under this sort of collective action, collective impact kind of model where we're all gonna collaborate and get together and, and volunteer our time. And we're all gonna do this because we have all these extra hours sure. to give. <laughs> and that's just what we're, that's what, we're, that's what we're gonna try to do, right? So it sounded great. Yeah. And so the governor said, you know, I want you to do this and I'm gonna give you no money. <laughs> and you know no funding and no mandate to speak of i'm going to ask everybody nicely which was basically a mandate for people to volunteer at the state agency level but really i'm just going to say you go out and go do this and try to get people to buy into this and you know try to sort of grow this coalition approach at the state level and we spent about two two or three years trying to get everybody playing well together at the state level um, all the state agencies health professions associations everybody from the prevention community to the medical community, harm reduction folks, um, treatment, early stage recovery support organizations, community organizations, law enforcement, courts, I mean, everybody on the whole spectrum of law and order um, from you know, the, the, the beat cop to the community corrections person on the back end, um, all the way through that, that spectrum, uh, and spent a lot of time trying to do that, which has been great uh, to, to get people to, uh, um, try to uh, you know work together uh, and and do things at the state level and coordinate. And then in the last couple of years, we've sort of turned our emphasis. Once we think we're doing a better job, uh, not perfect by any means, but a better job coordinating at the state level, is to try to figure out how to get federal resources and state resources and push them to local communities where the work actually gets done. It's people like you guys that you know do the work, get the things done. Dr. Kaplan providing services to patients on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, folks at hospitals, that's where the work gets done. Communities do the heavy lifting, and as, as that's the way the world works, as things really happen there, and the, the state just needs to get the heck out of the way and to try to provide resources where possible, um, provide assistance where possible, 
but then just basically help try to respond to local issues in the ways that make sense because every community is a little different in terms of who's at the table and how services get provided and what the role is of, of you know public health versus behavioral health versus different kinds of sec you know sectors and how these collaborations get built so our organization we do have 10 different work groups working on different levers of the problem everything from public awareness campaigns which used to be about safe use you know just don't kill people with opioids you know then it's safe storage and disposal and doing a lot more with take back and medication take back and trying to scale up resources for um, take back locations and and changing behavior towards getting rid of opioids when you are done with them uh, and you know getting a lot of the medicine cabinet problem addressed to things like provider education and we have an ambitious agenda to try to re-educate all providers in Colorado about safe opioid prescribing and then things like stigma and then things like MAT and primary care. So I love hearing about it, Dr. Kaplan. That's exactly what we're trying to do is get more of you doing that all across Colorado. Uh, so things like improving our PDMP and data systems, improving treatment systems and recovery oriented systems of care and developing the recovery community into a you know very viable, vibrant thing. But that whole community in terms of recovery <coughs> is very, young in terms of its development as an industry and um, there's a lot of needs for professionalization and standardization and and quality measurement and all kinds of things that are needed in the recovery support world to fully take advantage of of what really needs to be done and everybody i think agrees that we need recovery and we need recovery support but how to get there in a rational way uh, and to do that in a way that that makes sense and try to grow that um, and so we help with those kinds of things. So we do policy work, uh, working with the legislature to try to help craft policies that make sense for Colorado. And we do a lot of outreach to try to listen to communities and connect communities to the legislature so local voices are heard. Uh, we do a lot of that with the interim committee. Uh, we do program development work and implement some programs ourselves, like take back programs or naloxone education. There's gonna be a big naloxone statewide public awareness campaign coming this summer that we're funding uh, so that'll be another thing that you'll hear you know coming in uh, statewide messaging on that kind of thing that we do uh, so some of it is, is programs but a lot of it is partnering and how do we help support whether it's local coalitions or the southwest AHEC or you know whatever some areas boulder has its own coalition the Ampa valley has a regional task force um, you know it's just it looks different in every part of colorado but but I myself have been to all 64 counties of Colorado three times in my life. Um, once in the last two years, I've been to all 64 counties again. Wow. And it's, it's, there's a lot of commonalities, but it's different. You know, it's very different, obviously. Where you are in, in the southwest part of the state, in Durango and those surrounding counties, it's, 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 A, it's one of the, new, the most beautiful part of the state without question. But it's also just very, very different than being in La Junta, Colorado. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it, it's, all, it's an entirely different world in La Junta or Sterling, or you go to Steamboat Springs, or you go to, you know, wherever it is. And so we're trying to help with that. And to do that, we try to bring, you know, tools and resources and those sorts of things. We also have four external relations strategists, we call them, folks that are out in the communities helping. And Jessica um, Edie is the one for Southwestern Colorado who you've already, I think, heard her name, I think I heard her name mentioned already. Uh, yeah. But Jessica provides coalition support to Southwest AHEC and others. And in many regions, it is the AHEC that is doing a lot of convening and facilitation. Some regions, not as much, but, um, and it could have a different kind of, you know, convener. It might be a CTC thing, it might be public health, it might be, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, we just wanna make ourselves available, uh, whether that's myself, uh, or our, we have public um, public uh, awareness kinds of materials. We can connect with the statewide safe disposal program to grow safe disposal options. We can bring provider education events to communities or public awareness events to communities. We're debuting a new one uh, in about a month. Um, it's you know some personal stories of of everything from the difficulties and the loss and the tragedy of it, but also to survival and hope and transformation and, and success with treatment uh, to send a lot of messages uh, about this with personal stories from people here in Colorado 
really professionally done, you know, that we think is going to have some additional way to reach people. Um, everyone from um, middle schoolers on up to, 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 you know, everybody in the population to be able to hear some of these stories. So it's, it's very broad. Again, that's a lot of stuff what we do. But um, the message I want to bring to you is that, that we have uh, the desire to continue to engage with all of the work that you're doing, support it however we can. If you have a complaint that you say, hey, our legislature needs to hear this and this because this has to stop, you know, whatever it is, or we need this problem addressed. This is a barrier for us. We need this addressed. Uh, our pledge is to carry that message to the legislature, to funders, whether that's foundation, fund the foundation community, uh, OBH, CDC, via CDPHE, whoever the funders are, and then to our federal counterparts to tell them, hey, here's what we're seeing uh, on the ground in Colorado, and here's what we need changed. Uh, and that's our job is to try to help mm -hmm. take what, what your, your needs and, and, and concerns are and elevate them and then bring back what it is that you need. So that's, that's our, our overall mission. And I will just kind of leave it there because I know people probably have a lot of questions and it's really virtually impossible. We have like a whole day annual meeting where we describe what we do and it really does. It takes like yes. eight hours and a bunch of posters and you know, it's like, it's a whole lot of stuff that we're involved with in some way. The Alto Project, the CHA, we co-sponsored that with them and helped help with the training. We're doing a new project with the, the Hospital Association and the Medical Society, which is called Colorado's Cure to get not just the emergency docs who made those guidelines for Alto, but get all the other subspecialties creating their own specialty specific guidance for whether that's hospitalists or primary care docs, family docs, dentists, surgeons, whoever it is, so they can be doing the same kinds of things, opioid reduction, alternatives, harm reduction, and better access and awareness and referral to treatment as the four pillars. So we're you know, excited about that and and you know, trying to do everything we can at the state level uh, to kind of create things and build momentum uh, and help it that you know in the ways that we can. So that's my uh, that's my super high level overview, and I'd be happy to to take questions or try to direct you to the you know anyone if I don't have an answer to something, uh, which is very frequent. At least try to guide you in the right direction and get you to to people that do have answers. Oh, that's. Wow. That's great. No, thank you yes. very much. For that. Um, great work. Does anyone have on the call? Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, this is um, this is Louisa from Rocky Mountain Health Plans, and um, hi, Louisa. Hi. Um, sorry, I didn't. I wasn't here for the first few minutes of the call, and we're just having so much fun in Denver with the storm today. Um, and and uh, uh power has been going in and out so um but I, I have been on since about 10 minutes into the call um thank you to um paul and dan and dr valak for um all of your information um and christina and key um and i don't know if this is appropriate i just wonder um as far as next steps and um because obviously the um the topics today were all centered around um sud issues and uh, what's being done? Um, are you um, so? Is is the next meeting um, maybe to talk about how um, Southwest AHAC works within the Southwest Colorado community to? Um, I don't know if it's um, create better access to services. If that's something Rocky Mountain Health Plans can work with you all on. Mm -hmm. I'm working really closely. Mm -hmm the three hospitals in the area on their hospital transformation programs and uh, behavioral health and substance use are a huge, huge piece of those, um, of, of the hospital transformation program. So I'm excited just to figure out how we can all work together to um, address the issues both preventively, but then also um, uh, figure out what we're going to do um, uh, when folks need access to services. Louisa, this is Mary, um, and um, you and I have spoken briefly um, in our HTP meetings. Um, so I know you from that um, that arena, but I've also been working as regional health connector on substance abuse issues, and I would love to talk to you at, at some point and figure out how we can put our heads together and um, 
best support this region, uh, you know, between our efforts, Rockies Hospital Transformation Program and um, other coalitions that are existing regionally. Um, would you be willing to do that? Um, there's a lot of work we're doing within our AHEC as well, uh, working with providers and also other um, initiatives around educating community members. So I'd love to talk to you a lot more about all of that. Yeah, that sounds great. And um, the more that um, um, I know, Dr. Kaplan, we had a, a rough road when July forward with working with you and the the uh, lovely nightmare of working with the state to get providers um, contracted. Um, but I know that that's um, resolved now. Yes. Anything else? That, yeah. And I think that as we talk about Southwest Colorado and anything else we can do to figure out how to um, create better access. Um, f obviously, if Dr. Kaplan's working with folks on MAT, you know, how do we also make sure they're getting the behavioral health support they need? Um, and are there more pro or independent behavioral health providers um, down in that area who would be willing to see? And obviously, Rocky's focus is Medicaid. Um, but, um, and obviously you all work with more than just Medicaid, but, um, but you know, is there, are there other independent providers who would be willing to see Medicaid who were kind of shut out of the networks before? Um, just those are the kinds of issues I want to talk about is how do we expand access and make sure people are getting in for, um, mm -hmm. the services that, that, um, they require. So that, that is a huge problem, Louisa, is, uh, is nobody, no, um, accepts Medicaid. Um, of the, of the um, for psychotherapy, for psychiatric care, for mm -hmm. so that's why I am doing it myself because I have nowhere to send them. Yeah, uh, and is that? Um, do you think, Dr. Kaplan, is that? Um, is it the Medicaid fee schedule? Like, is that the big barrier? You no, know, it, it's partially the reimbursement and the amount of time these folks take. So it's it's a double whammy. Uh, I can't get in and out of these rooms with these patients in 15 minutes because they have so much going on sure, sure and and what what you know should be an easy suboxone visit and then they tell me they were raped over the weekend or they open up how they were you know sexually abused and they were 12 and then it's like yeah it's okay there's the horse out of the gate on that one that, that appointments you know? so yeah, yeah there's so much so one thing i i've learned and i've been learning week by week is that um, I'm trying to bring these all these services within my institution because they don't want to go elsewhere because they get judged and the, the and the stigma. Right, right. So, um, so, so when you say that, I mean, is that are you able, uh, you know, are you able to recruit and add more um, therapists within your own practice? Advertising right now for a master's level clinician, we can't find one. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's hard. We're, we're, so that's part of the problem here. Uh, Attention is the one of the biggest issues. We don't have a huge yeah. pool of, of uh, candidates like Denver does. We have to pay higher salaries and we're reimbursed lower than the front range by Medicaid. Yeah. So it's a triple whammy. When I first started this, they're like, oh yeah, you guys can get, uh, counselors for $15 an hour down or $16 an hour down in Durango. I'm, I'm really? I'm like, not, not yeah. my world. We can't. Um, yeah. Cause that's what they pay in Denver and that's what the other uh, OTPs okay. are paying okay. for, for addiction counseling. So, you know, I'm paying 23 an hour. So it's, yeah. you know, uh, those are the challenges. Uh, the show rate, for our, our patient show rates are 25, 30%. Sure. Um, so well, that's- and, some, and so maybe the, yeah, I mean, I think Mary and Dr. Kaplan, those are some of the conversations I think that we can have because, you know, the care coordinators that we have down in the Southwest to work with, um, with our, um, our members, um, we, we're asking them to do things like figure out transportation. And, and I realize it's not always transportation. Some of it's just my life's, you know, in complete crisis and chaos and I can't make it to an appointment today, right? I mean, there's, there's many reasons, but um, you know, how can we help with some of those things and maybe pinpoint some of those things to um, increase a show rate? 
So sure. I mean, these are all str are, are struggles that we have. Um, and if we can keep people in treatment, we keep them out of the hospital, and, and they don't belong in the ER trying to right, right, or take up law enforcement. Uh, yeah, or capacity. exactly. Yeah. So yeah, we just have to keep whittling away at this at these issues, and you know, from all the different aspects. And, yeah, because it costs yeah, us as a community a lot costs, more if we don't. I mean, you know, talking about EMTs and law enforcement and everyone else that is tangentially supporting everyone. If we could do more upstream prevention, it would certainly save everyone a lot more money. Yeah. 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 And Louise, yeah. So if we could affect and we could help one person, I, I, I try to describe this as like a, a ship in, in the ocean. The weight behind it is their their family, their, their co workers, their friends we can get that ship going straight it, you know it affects so many lives behind them as well as the tax dollars the, the, the hospital beds needed the ICU the the, the incarceration the uh, the cost of the system because I just I was at a two-hour drug court meeting at noon today and the, the, the our system pays for rehabilitation uh, for residential our system pays for incarceration mm -hmm. we don't pay well, it, it's so um, one thing that would be helpful is if we could figure out a way to pay for treatment and they can maintain their Medicaid somehow in jail. Um, that, that is a big problem. They, they lose their Medicaid services. Their no, they don't anymore. There's a suspension. Um, they get basic, but no, they used to and they don't anymore. Oh, well, the jail's on the impression they do because they just... Yeah. <laughs> We're a little behind on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They just told, we just yeah. discussed this. That's oh, really? Okay. Um, That's actually the case. This is La Plata County Jail or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the, there's a lot of things that anyone else does too. Right. Uh, more cost effective treatments. Um, everybody's really quick to recommend Vivitrol in the, in the uh, incarcerated population. Well, it doesn't work any better than the $5 a month oral naltrexone. But Archimedes is really good at marketing Vivitrol to, um, you know, and these are my tax dollars, how I see it. You know, Vivitrol is twelve to $18,000 a year. Well, I could treat, you know, four people for that rather than one person on right. Vivitrol. Mm -hmm. So um, cost-effective treatment, um, one obstacle that we just, uh, I, I, are you familiar with CARF? I'm not. Okay, CARF, uh, the Joint Commission, you've, everybody knows what the Joint Commission is, oh, right? Yeah. CARF was a, a subset, uh, it was a division of the Joint Commission that just did behavioral health accreditation. We have to be accredited either by the Joint Commission or CARF to maintain our federal license. Uh, we just had, went through our CARF um, accreditation inspection uh, two weeks ago, and uh, she came out um, from, um, she runs an OTP, uh, opioid treatment program in Rhode Island, She's done about 50 surveys, 50 different clinics in the last two, year and a half. And she was aghast that I have to test for marijuana and penalize people for marijuana use in this state where it's legal. Huh. And that is a, a huge obstacle. We used to test for it and just not penalize them. Um, yeah, yeah. We had we had a our soda came out with the state opioid treatment authority and she's like what you're not penalizing these people for using marijuana, yeah. so we lost a third of our patients in no, four weeks wow. because they're like well you can't smoke weed I'm not, I'm not continuing it oh I'm gonna go use heroin <laughs> screw that you know you can't tell me I can't smoke weed so <laughs> right, right. so she was like you need to get to the state level you need to change that you need to keep these people in treatment if that yeah you know this is a harm reduction this mm -hmm. isn't you know mm -hmm. an abstinence-based mm -hmm. mentality so at the state level we have that obstacle and that has to go to the to the senate to be changed is right. Rob Valick still on the line no he he's just, he's he's just the federal yeah. government doesn't require me to test for marijuana and here I have to penalize people for that. So yeah, that could be something maybe the consortium could be I mean, into because I mean they've got more capacity for it than right. we do. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. a small thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Great. I think I think that that dialogue definitely needs to be continued. And then yeah. I think to uh, Louisa, to you, I think this is key. I think uh, 
the question or the suggestion you asked uh, at the beginning is it's 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 right on actually you're asking uh, do we have more opportunity for dialogues like this we need to talk more yes. in, in terms of details actually from spa's pers perspective we used to have three work groups right we used to have uh, one work group on policy one on you know, care integration and the third one on workforce development i think starting from this year where we are actually uh, are thinking about regroup or uh, consider maybe creating new work groups if needed and then you know stop the old work, uh, work groups so i think a uh, part of the uh, meeting the goal of this meeting is to bring up this issue definitely and then um we're thinking potentially opioid crisis and maybe substance uh, substance abuse in general or behavioral health could be uh work group under our spa meeting and also Luisa you, men you mentioned the hospital transformation is a very big thing mm -hmm. here and I th that could be another option so I think given that um, definitely we will like Christina definitely will work, work with you guys in terms of forming new work groups under spa and then we're going to have more detailed focused dialogue within those work groups like targeting each specific um, problems here in our region so um speaking of time we can let's quickly run a poll. to our polling though. yeah we uh, actually we want some input from our, our group here right now uh we're going to use this tool called pool everywhere i think most of you guys have already tried before but if this is new to you there's two ways to participate one is to use a browser i think it's much easier if you are with a computer right now the other one is you can use your cell phone if you don't have a computer. So uh, if you use a, a browser, look at the left side of the slide, just simply put poolev.com slash keyjong474 as the address in your browser. And then you should be able to see a welcome page to say, hey, you, you're you know, entering to my presentation. And all the polling today, which we only have three, uh, are anonymous so you don't have to worry about being exposed you can just skip the introduce yourself and wait until we uh, initiate the uh, survey if you if you're using your cell phone simply text use your text uh, um, message fun function text keyjong 474 to the number 22333 so so the number is 22333 that's the number you're texting to don't confuse the number and the, and, and the text and then you'll get a reply immediately saying you have joined Key John's session. All right, everybody have, everybody's ready? Any problems? Okay. Oh, good? Good, okay, I'm gonna initiate the first polling question. John Will, please. Mm -hmm. I have a backup plan. Let's do it right here. Uh, it happened before, so I know. I'm going to share my browser. Here we go. Oh, can I, yeah. Yes, can you guys see? Oh, wow. So the question is what do you think are the top issues regarding the open crisis in our region? You can choose multiple choices. You, like, you, you can choose more than one option. You just reply if you are on your phone just reply by a b c or d or e so can you still get on after yes okay okay yes okay. you can you can choose more than one option all right you can choose i think up to maybe okay. yes we can see the result right now thank you i think this is this question definitely all of them are involved based on you know the information uh, given by you know, Paul and Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Valak, but here is more about our region. Like, what do you think are the most top issues here that that we have to address first in order to get this, you know, collaborative going? Can we pick more than one for this one? It's just one. You can you, you can choose more than one. Yeah, whatever you choose, you think.
I think by using a phone, you have to reply one letter at a time. I think just, right, you can't really do like- So in the text, you just reply in here? Yeah, it's like a dialogue. Just reply A and then reply B and reply G, whatever you want. Great, we see some good numbers. Definitely your first one, public awareness and stigma is top one. That's what we see from our work, definitely. And then number J, exactly, coexisting challenges, as Dr. Kaplan just mentioned. It's very complex and correlated. You can't really treat one at one time. You just, it just has to be a collaborative package deal. Unfortunately, a lot of the um, treatment direction with the data waiver program is just addressing the, the, the one substance mm -hmm. and not the whole person. Right, right. Great, I think, are we done? <clears throat> I think we're done. So. What's the okay, still the moving. Day? So A is what the percent, because I'm blocking yeah. it with my. Oh, I can move that if oh. you want. It's 25%, that's the highest, I think definitely. We can do that small, like, yeah. And unfortunately, I found with the stigma part of this is that there are people that yeah. are open and well, the same people that go to the same events that are already um, aware and don't judge. Yep. It's the ones that are, are, have blinders on and you cannot reach, mm -hmm. and they're blind and deaf, and I've, I, I have tried and tried and tried, and it, it, yeah. it's very, it's, so. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. You find the same thing? Yeah. And the same thing for uh, lots of issues, like the suicide issue as well, right. like all over the area, mm -hmm. you know, just trying to reach those, to reach people. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. I'm going to move into the next question. Similar. This is just a, we want to get some data uh, to show our buying here. Like, do you think, because lo locally, we currently, we don't have a uh, formalized or like even informal, like a work group or coalition uh, to address the opioid crisis in our region collaboratively. So do you think it is, and, and, and given we, we also have our own challenges here in our region, you know, mm -hmm. we have this, our unique situation. There are a lot of barriers and challenges in terms of working together on the same issue. Yeah, we don't have one so, that's broad. We've got one that's focused, you know, a, a little bit on you. We've yes. Got a little bit, I mean, just like, sort of a scattering but yes. we don't have something that's like an umbrella yes i think mm -hmm. for those who voted not sure i think that's definitely their concern and also i'm our concern too it's like right. yes we do need we think it's necessary but if it's like possible or plot you know well it is so broad I think it is you know yeah. it's it, it's it's touching like this i mean yes. yeah because it's I think it's trying to identify truly what the what the discussion is going to yeah. be about. Or yeah, yeah. A anyone who voted not sure want to comment? Like why you think it's not sure? Like or what? What are you con? What are your concerns? Or or is there some other focus? Yeah. Anyone wants to comment? No. Hi, this is Heather from Region Nine. Hi, I Heather. didn't. Hi, I didn't. I actually voted yes. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, a couple of the things I'm hearing are, they're great to hear. So um, Dan and Paul um, and Dr. Balak mm -hmm. touched on this. I think maybe one of the most beneficial things about having a collaborative work group starts with consistent education and messaging. And the, the, the fact that a lot of people up here said public awareness, I know that just from the world I work in, it doesn't have to be the opioid crisis. It can be mm -hmm. any any issues that we're working on, economic related, people related, what have you. Um, those of us that are the boots on the ground know a lot of this stuff like the back of our hands. So I think we assume that our public knows right. more right. than they That's do. Correct. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, you do get, I think Dan, you mentioned it, it's the same 10 people syndrome. So we get the same 10 to 12 people at all the meetings who are already the ones that same people. know yeah. And it's really getting the word and the education out. And it, we, we might feel like we sound like broken records, but it really takes the broken record to keep people informed. And the last thing I want to say about this is I loved hearing the, if we think about consistent messaging, I think one of the best gifts that we could give the, the public to start getting them um, 
or giving them better uh, tools to work with because when you know better, you can do better is the trauma informed approach. I mean, mm -hmm. so you guys talked about whether it's the holistic thing is it really starts with getting to a place where we remove a lot of our biases and the boundaries that keep us from actually treating people with drug addiction as if they are um, lepers or worse or aliens or, you know, not in my backyard. So mm -hmm. I appreciate hearing that. And I think it's going to take a while. It's a cultural, it's a mind shift for a lot of people. Yes. Um, yeah. So thank you for, for that. I can, no, thank um, you. I can tell you when I opened my clinic, I, um, I was, I feel like I was ostracized by the medical community mm -hmm. and blamed for addicts moving to Durango. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I was accused of that over yeah. and over again. You're going to attract every addict in the region yeah. to move to Durango. Right. I'm like, no, they're here working in every restaurant, everywhere you are, you know, and... At right. every level of society. Right. I, I have attorneys, that. accountants, yes. um, cops in my practice. Yeah. So yeah. I can... <laughs> it's, it's really when I hear that kind of mentality, yeah. it's like... Yes. Mm -hmm. People yes. choose to move to an expensive mountain town for treatment. Yes. Yeah. Mm, no. Well, and how about if we got to the point where it was like, great, yeah, they are okay. No, <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. yeah. But actually, they can these are these here. are uh, largely the children of people who live here that mm -hmm. I'm taking care yeah. of. Yeah. So. Yeah. This is the, what um, spurred the idea of adding something to our wall event that's coming on April 26th called the Art of Addiction, mm -hmm. um, because I had this idea that. You know, these are the people that you assume are a, of, a, of a certain capacity. Right. And so just to like broaden people's perceptions around who is addicted, you know, that is the mm -hmm. focus of um, some of the visual information that's going to be there. You know, like it's people, that you, it's everyone, right. it's everyone. And <laughs> so it, it's meant to raise awareness around who that population is. It's yeah. everybody. That's right. Great. Thank you, Heather. I think that also reminds me, like, as as we just voted public awareness and the stigma is number of like you know sure. one of the top issue and then also the stigma of the stigma is <laughs> is another mm -hmm. challenge right mm -hmm. so anyway so thank thank you guys for the input and the last one really quick just what do you think should be involved who should be involved if we're gonna have a coalition or, or a work group under spa uh, to targeting this issue, like who do you think should absolutely be involved in, in, in the group? Like we can, the collaboration cannot move without those uh, people. Like who do you think should be on, on there? Like, and this one is the open question. You just type in whatever you want. Like, and what, what I mean, who is not like who, but it's like organization wise, like, you know. Whether it's law enforcement. Yeah, like uh, sector wise, like law enforcement definitely should be on. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you, if you guys can just type in, and you can type in more than once, there's no limits. Here we go. Law enforcement, definitely. We wanted to have some speakers from, uh, law enforcement uh, at the beginning, but unfortunately we couldn't. Mm -hmm. But definitely we will keep uh, them uh, informed as our uh, work group. We definitely need them to be on board. Education, yeah, primary care, hospitals. Shouldn't be involved. <laughs> <laughs> Hospitals. So the as you see the the graph, as the the words the phrases becomes bigger because that's why that's because it's voted by a lot of you know people. Mm -hmm. Like if, mm -hmm. if more if more than one people voted for hospitals, that one's gonna be bigger. So that's why. My response didn't come across properly. This is Heather. My my <laughs> response was, who shouldn't be involved? I started typing in a bunch of <laughs> um, sectors and organizations, and uh, I can't think of one entity right. 
organization or whatever in an in a community that shouldn't have some representation in this issue. That's right. That's correct. It should be like inclusive. Churches, Everybody should be the religious. Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. yeah. yeah Students, families, exactly families. We need to have Schools. some representative from you know mm -hmm. local community, just as a mother or as a father. You know, mm -hmm. just parents. Yes. You know, it's good to see pediatricians on here too, because some yes. of those sim oh. primary care um, practices I've been working with, you know, it's, they're kind of slow to think that um, addiction could be an issue in their practice. Mm -hmm. You know, although, you know, we push the issue and say, well, maybe not the student, but maybe the parent. You know, I mean, there's yeah. uh, there's a way to. So, I, you know, we're trying to just, of course, raise awareness around the issue at all levels. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. Go great. Louise, yes. And this is Louisa on the phone. Um, key. Um, you know, one of the things I I typed in uh, the restaurants and bars. Um, yes, I saw that. Awesome. There's a um, oh, I'm gonna have to look it up. There was a story recently about um, a push to have um, for for restaurants and bars to have um, kind of a almost like a sober. I don't want to call it even a support group, but for people that want to work there that that's the job they can get and it could be because of a, a legal issue in their background um mm. uh, but but some of those jobs working in restaurants and bars you know those folks have really high um incidences of sud issues and you, know, you mm -hmm. get off work at two in the morning some of it's the schedule some of it's you get off work and you have a you know a pocket full of cash because you got tips mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and 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 the and the the you know the, kind of the culture is to sit around and drink and do drugs and then you get to sleep till two or three in the mm -hmm. afternoon and go to work the next day. Yeah. But you know, there's lots of um, people who are working on sobriety who want to work. Who those are the jobs they can get. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you create those kinds of support groups for people in the restaurant industry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good that's perspective. Good yes. Yeah. No, it's great. Great, we're running a little late. Thank, thanks, everybody, for 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 you know hanging on with us uh, really quick. So we're done with the poll. Uh, let me share back to. Uh, okay, here we go. So I think um, just a quick. Lastly, just uh, three uh, logistic updates. So I sent it out uh, the meeting invitation for the four quarterly meetings for our spa uh, for the whole year, uh, and including this one. And Christina uh, thinks there's no better way to kind of change the organizer and owner of the meeting. So Christina will probably send out a new invitations for the meeting, maybe a series of meetings, maybe just for each meeting. So you'll be uh, getting that uh, pretty soon. And then just keep, keep that one, keep the one Christina sent and then delete the one that I sent. And also the next spa meeting uh, originally was scheduled on June 12th, but actually we have our camp, annual camp <coughs> during that time. So we uh, need to push that uh, one week later, which is on June 19th. So you don't have to remember this. Uh, Christina will send out invitations later. And also, we're thinking work group survey after this meeting. We're going to uh, create a survey, send out to everybody, including all the members on the spa list, to, to, to collect mm -hmm. some ideas in, term, in terms of uh, future work groups, um, you know, topics, mm -hmm. including probably including opioid and, you know, and hospital transformation, potentially others. So you will be getting that. Yeah. Oh. One. Oh, thank you, Heather. Oh, thanks, Heather. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think, yeah, let's see. Any uh, other words from you guys? I think that's... Uh, One thing i just like yep. to see change. Again, this is state level. Because mm -hmm. um, we have such a shortage of difficulty getting counselors in the state, especially rural areas, mm -hmm. is that they need to ease and uh, accelerate the OBH licensing. It takes up to six months for someone who wants to move to Colorado to, to get their certifications transferred over if they can. Yeah, yeah. I call it the alphabet soup of behavioral health because mm -hmm. of the initials after people's names um, are very different state to state and there's mm -hmm. no... Um, so, so you're saying just a general, like a 
general practice practitioner coming over here, moving from another state? A counselor. A counselor. A nurse or, in the compact program, maybe licensed in 21 states at once, whatever it is now. Yeah, they need reciprocity. Huh? There's no reciprocity with counseling, state to state. Okay. And, and what a, a licensed professional counselor in this day is called something else in another state. Okay. And so there's no consistency and uh, uh, it's, it's a huge problem because we've tried to hire people and like we could. I wonder if that's something that Dr. Vallett could present. Um, I think we should contact him on a couple of those. I think it's things. a big option. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, that uh, retention is the biggest issue down right. here for, for sure. providers. Um, you know, just getting licensed professionals to stay, to get hired, first of all, and then actually to stay. Well, it's the cost yeah. of living, the lack of reimbursement. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you guys, staff. whoever's on. Um, yeah. And we I pay mean, pretty well. I know. Yeah. 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 But in like you know, Cortez, that's huge. Yeah, thank you guys. I think we're going to keep okay. talking here a little bit, but you can just uh, sign up if you want to. These are yeah. like the 50,000. But Thank you. I see you. Yeah. Fixed, and often it's not like the provider themselves are satisfied, but it might be the spouse. Mm -hmm. that's like, 